Okay. <laughs> Since yesterday, uh, my enthusiasm in seeing so many people gathered together in order to discuss subject matters concerning um, China logic has kept equally vivid. And I will start my talk by warmly thank Peter Flugel and his team at the Center of China Studies to, for having enabled this event. So thank you very much. So today my lecture is intended um, in the first part as a presentation of a classical uh, controversy between the Buddhist and the Jainas concerning the nature and scope of the universal relations that are grounding uh, inferences. In a second part, I will uh, aim at showing that it is possible to reconstruct a reply to the Buddhist criticisms from the Jain Manikyanandi's account of the way one is enabled to infer not only from apprehension of a given evidence, but from its non-apprehension too. So, um, I just need to, okay. <laughs> so, once upon a time, the Buddhist Dharmakirti addressed some virulent criticisms against the Jain conception of inference. On the Digambar side, Akalanka is the first thinker to give a systematic answers to those criticisms. But following his Buddhist opponent's style, Akalanka gives very concise uh, answer. Um, today, I, I'm working on Manikyanandi's Parikshamukam because it is uh, so the introduction to philosophical investigation because it consists in a digest of the final and mature uh, epistemology of Akalanka. So he, here he explicitly states the disagreements between the sc two schools, plus he is developing a very nice theory of non-apprehension. Um, plus, uh, I will um, so I will present what what can be considered as a tradition of Akalanka on inference, such as it is found in the Parikshamukam and in the Pramaya Kamara Martanda, the sun that grows the lotuses of the knowable. Uh, that is a commentary by Prabhachandra on the Parikshamukam. Uh, plus, this, in this last work, um, Prabhachandra is presenting Dharmakirti's view, uh, such as it is found in Dharmakirti's Pramanavartika Svavriti, so the auto-commentary on notes on the means to acquire knowledge. So, um, Inference, as you all know, is an indirect faculty of knowledge that enables one to know some properties not knowable directly by the external senses. The general pattern of it is that one knows by this inference that the property A is present because one knows by another knowledge process, for example perception, that the property B is present. Plus, one knows that there is a universal relation linking these two properties and this universal relation, in turn, is granting the fact that the first property can never be seen without the second ones. Henceforth, the first property is seen as an evidence for the presence of the second one. So one of the main discussions between Indian schools of thought uh, concerns the nature of this evidence and of the invariable concomitance, the, which is the name of this universal relation between the two. So, um, First of all, Manikyanandi uh, accepts four types of invariable concomitants. So uh, invariable concomitants might hold between either two coexistent, between either a pervaded property and its pervasive property, either between a predecessor and its successor, and either between an effect and its cause. Let us begin with the less problem problematic relation, namely the relation that holds between a pervaded property and its per pervasive, pervasive sorry, property, viapa viapaka. This type of invariable concomitance defines a type of inference related to class identity. These cases are the less problematic ones since there are cases, to phrase it in an anachronistic way, of analytic inclusion of a class within another. So the example put forward by Manikyanandi is the following one. Knowing that sound is a product is sufficient uh, for one to know that sound endures change. So in this case, uh, the invariable concomitance which guarantees the correctness of the inference is due to a relation of identity of nature 
between the property of being a product and the property of enduring change. Because um, a product is part of the thing's enduring change. So to this point, um, with the exception of differences in the underlying theories, there are no major disagreements on, between Jain and Buddhist on one counts as a correct invariable concomitance. Um, another type of invariable concomitance is the, um, granted by the Jainas is the one that holds between two coexistent, Sahachara. This type of invariable concomitance gathers together the cases in which something is um, never seen without another. For example, it is sufficient to see one face of a coin, say tails, in order to know that the other face will be uh, heads. So when presented this type of inference, Mani Kiamlandi uses what I call the mango inference, uh, which consists in saying that knowing that this has a taste of a mango is sufficient to know that this, this has visible properties of a mango. Um, the Buddhists recognize that this is a correct um, example of inference, but they deny that it belongs to the category of coexistence. Uh, why is that so? Um, it is so because um, when Dharma Kirti uh, introduced the, the different types of invariable concomitants is considering a, as correct one, he said that there are only two types of them. Um, First of all, uh, every types of invariable concomitants, according to Dharma Kitty, are uh, involve the relation uh, between uh, a pervaded property and a, its pervasive property. And uh, there are two subtypes of such invariable concomitants, namely uh, the identity of nature and uh, causality. So. Um, what he calls identity of nature, Svabhava, is, is the same that the giant relation between pervaded and pervasive. And uh, here is, it is important to understand that when you speak about causality, causality is in a certain sense a relation of class inclusion because in Dharma Kirti's theory, causal relations are translatable in terms of relation of identity of nature. Because two things have the same nature if and only if they have the same causes. So, and this deep link between causality and identity of nature is precisely what is ensuring the necessity of the invariable concomitance between two causal properties. Um, so, so um, the Buddhists will have to show that uh, the Mongo uh, inference is a correct one, but is not... Um, dependent upon, upon the category of coexistence. And according to the Jainas, they will do so by showing that um, everything in the Mongo inference it's, is translatable in terms of causality. So we can reconstruct the following inference. Uh, this is sufficient to know that this has a taste of, the mon of a Mongo in order to know that all the conditions of the presence of a Mongo are met. And this is turn in terms, is sufficient to know that this has visible properties of a mango. So um, one does not need the category of coexistence in order to, to explain why this inference is a correct one. Uh, no, by rephrasing it this way, the Jainas are but preparing their next defense against the Buddhist attack. But in order to, to explain this, I have to, I have to uh, say two words on on the, about the conception of causality the two schools um, are holding. So, the invariable concomitance between an effect and its cause, karya karana, uh, is the can canonical model for the presentation of an inference schemata. The most famous cases of it uh, being one's knowledge of the presence of a fire in the hill, on the hill, due to one's knowledge of the presence of smoke on the hill at stake. The popularity of this type of inference based on causality is due to the fact that it turns an inference into a scientific explanation. When presenting this type of inference, Manikyanandi uses the following example. Paul, knowing that there is speech ability in this individual, is sufficient to know that there is intelligence 
in this individual because speech ability is but an effect of uh, the intelligence. So, um, although Jainas and Buddhists agree on this example, they would not agree on its converse because their marketing considers that only, only the effect and not the cause can serve as a, an evidence in a correct inference. Um, so, only the effect and not the cause is a correct evidence. Why is that so? Because um, the cause is not sufficient as an, an, as an evidence because one can never be sure that the two following prerequisites are being fulfilled, namely that no impediment is blocking the potential of the given cause to produce its effect, and secondly, that all the, condi all the conditions required for the production of the effect are present. So you can maybe see now why, um, why the reformulation by Manikyanandi of the Mongo inference is an attack against the Buddhist. Uh, Manikyanandi said that those who accept to infer the visible properties of a fruit by means of the inference of the totality of the condition of the presence of this fruit, itself obtained from the taste of this very fruit, those accept too that the cause of something is an evidence for the presence of this thing wherever no over conflicting cause is blocking off the efficiency of the cause at stake. So if we go back on the inference, uh, you can see that um, the totality of conditions of the presence are of a mango uh, is a cause and is used as an evidence for the inference of the visible properties of a mango. So here the Buddhists uh, say that cause is no good evidence, but they are using a cause as an evidence. So uh, this is the Jaina criticism against the Buddhist here. But, um, but so um, if we have a closer look on one Dharmakirti says, uh, it seems that it is, he is not dying with a mango skin in his mouth due to this attack because <laughs> he, he happens to consider it possible to draw an inference in which causes are used as somewhat a kind of evidence. And these types of inference, according to him, fall into the general category of inference whose evidence is an identity of nature. Um, so Dharmakiti is saying that the arising of an effect which is inferred through the complete cause is called an identity of nature because it has no dependence upon any further object. So um, this new statue, um, to perceive the totality of causes as a kind of property of the effect, so as the identity of nature, uh, is allowed because, as we have seen, there is a deep connection between uh, identity of nature and causality in the Marcotte's theory. So what this new statues bring is that the Buddhists accept uh, identity of nature as a correct evidence. So they can say that the Mongo inference is a correct one without, without being uh, forced to accept cause as a correct evidence here. So, um, but there is another this attack consists in uh, several parts, uh, and one part of the criticism still remain. Um, oh, so. in, in, um, in his commentary to the Parikshamukham, um, Prabhachandra reminds us that according to the Buddhist, knowledge can be of what is past and present, not future. But here again, a closer look on Dharmakirti's theory will reveal that this problem has been avoided when he said that this identity of nature is but a virtual identity of nature, Svabhavabhuta. And that what is inferred is not the actual arising of the effect, but the potential of the effect to arise. So, uh, so in uh, Gillian and Hayes' words, Dharmakirti has taken into account the fact that um, the beautifully colored apple that showed promise of tasting sweet may turn out to have a bitter taste. So, more broadly speaking, what Dharmakit is trying to save here by the introduction of this uh, rephrasing is nothing less than our ability to make prediction. So, within this reformulation, cause can be used as a correct evidence. 
So if we reconstruct the inference, we have that knowing that this has the taste of a mango is sufficient to know that all the conditions of the presence of the mango are met. And this is turn, um, used as a virtual identity of nature. It's sufficient to know that this has visible properties of a mango, uh, having in mind that this is a potential effect and not the actual one. Uh, so, the next move from the giant side is to show that even with this rescue of cause as a somewhat evidence, the Buddhist cannot give an account of all correct types of inference. One is legitimate to draw. Uh, why is that so? Uh, it, it is because there is um, another type of invariable concomitance uh, due to worldly regularities. Due to worldly regularities, some phenomena are predictable. This is called the invariable concomitance between a predecessor and its successor, purvotachara, purvotarachara. Um, this invariable concomitance between a predecessor and its successor is a separate kind of uh, invariable concomitance. It cannot be translated, says Manikyanandi, in terms of identity of nature nor of causality. Because contrary to them, this one is a relation between two phenomena separated by a time interval. Um, yes. <laughs> so the inference uh, presented here by Mani uh, is the following one. Sorry, sorry for that. Knowing that the Pleiades are, are rising at a given moment is sufficient to know that Aldebaran will rise uh, in the future. So the rising of one star can be known from the rising of another one, even though there is no relation of causality nor of identity between these two risings. By the way, the Arabic name, Arabic name Aldebaran is another recognition for the non-succession between these two stars, since it means the follower. So the claim of the giant side here is to say that if Dharma Kirti tries to, tries to trace back cases of succession and um, cases of succession to identity of nature and causality, for example, by like in the case of the mango inference, by saying that knowing that the Pleiades are rising is sufficient to know that, for example, the world is in the state A, and this cognition enables me to infer that Aldebaran will, will rise. Uh, this will not save uh, their argument be, 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 because, sorry, Prabhachandra uh, reminds us that according to the Buddhist, the relation of identity holds only between two synchronous phenomena and the relation of causality holds between two phenomena that take place in continuity. That is to say in succession but without any time interval between them. So there will be no possibility to, to go from Tn up to Tn plus one here. So um, in relation to conceptions of time, uh, Peter made it clear that uh, in, in his lecture that there are more than enough materials for another independent lecture, but I will not concentrate on this argument here. Instead, I, I kindly invite those who want more on this to, to look at Anne Clavel's work on the Pleiades Aldebaran inference in Akalanka. And as far as today's talk is, is concerned, I am interested in showing that another part of the Buddhist and the Jain theories, namely the respective theories of non apprehension, um, is such that the Buddhists do not need a distinction between causal relation and relation of succession here, but the Jainas do. So, the theory of non apprehension. In the first section, we have been studying not all types of correct inferences, but only correct inferences related to apprehension. Now, one can acquire new knowledge through non apprehension, Anuparabdi, too. First of all, according to Manikyanandi, one is justified to infer the absence of a given establishable property in case one has apprehended an, an incompatible evidence to it. 
So 20 this con- minutes gone. Oh, 20 oh, minutes gone. 20, okay. So uh, this concerns correct inferences only in case the evidence at stake is a pervaded property, an effect, a cause, a predecessor, a successor, or a coexistence. So I will pass very quickly on this because um, the only disagreement uh, between the Buddhist and the Jainas here are but the same that the disagreements they had in the case of apprehension, namely, namely the fact that um, no cause can serve as a good evidence, nor successions, uh, successive relations, nor coexistent relations. So, um, okay, skip this. And uh, the, the, in the second case of uh, non apprehension there is no much uh, difference either. The fir- third case of non apprehension will interest us. So in this uh, second case, one is justified to infer the absence of an, estib- of an establishable property in case one has not apprehended its evidence. So this concerns correct inference um, only in cases the evidence is either a pervasive property, an effect, a cause, a predecessor, a successor, or a coexistent. So if, if one asks about the difference between apprehension of a an incompatible and non-apprehension of a compatible. Uh, let me take as an example the difference between saying he, is, he isn't happy and he is unhappy. More precisely, uh, in he is unhappy, the negation concerns a determined domain. More precisely, one is speaking about an individ- individual who has feeling and who has a precise feeling of unhappiness, whereas in he is not happy, the negation concerned um, a broader range of meanings. Um, he might have another feeling that happiness, or he might have no feeling at all. From this, the correctness of the inference involving each type of negation, that is to say, uh, apprehension of an incompatible evidence or non-apprehension of a compatible evidence, um, the correctness of the inference involving those won't be the same. So they are not redundant categories. So a consequence of this fact is that one can combine these two types of non-apprehension so as to derive the third and last category. Um, Okay, and this is uh, the Jaina touch in the sense that it is not discussed in Dharmakirti. Uh, Pramana Vartika. So, um, more precisely, according to Manitian Kyanandi, one is justified to infer the presence of an establishable property from the absence of an incompatible evidence, in case the latter is either an effect, a cause, or an essence. So, uh, I haven't been speaking about the relation of essence up to now, which is called Svabhava, but very, very quickly, it is the relation that holds between a thing and its direct essence, like, for example, um, the pot and the, the potness. So it should not be mistaken with the Buddhist relation of identity of nature, Svabhava, too. Uh, I haven't been speaking about it because the Jainas uh, do not present it when they do present the different types of invariable com- committance, but are introducing it only here at this place. So for the time being, we left as an open question, the question uh, whether to know why they are introducing this fifth type of invariable concomitance that late. But it is mainly to, to prove their um, theories of an, Anikanta Veda. Um, so here we aim at showing that this last disagreement between the Jainas and the Buddhists is connected to their disagreement on the admitted types of invariable Concomitants. Why is that so? Because in the first case of non apprehension, there is a difference between the cases of application of the invariable concomitants related to succession and the cases of application of the invariable concomitants related to causality. More precisely, from the non-apprehension of an effect, one can infer the presence of its cause. I think there is an example here. Yes, from the non-apprehension of connection with dear ones, which is an incompatible, 
one can infer that this creature has grief. But uh, from the non-apprehension of a successor, one cannot infer the presence of its predecessor. So uh, this difference is crucial, why? Because it is the only difference that one can find between the cases of application of um, the invariable concomitants related to succession and the one related to causality. So this is made evident in the following table uh, in which you, you see uh, that the only difference relies in the final column. So in other words, the way one knows things by means of an inference differs if the inference is based on causality or on succession. Therefore, reducing Manikyanon this classification of types of invariable concomitants would produce the collapsing of these different ways to gain knowledge from inference. And this is one reason why succession should be recognized as a separate category, separated from causality and from identity of nature. Thank you for your attention.